Hi there, Dave Levine here. Thanks ever so much for joining me for episode number 44 of the Sports Stories podcast. This is the podcast where we dive and delve into the lives and the sports stories of those people who have had influential experiences of working in and through sport. Now, last uh, episode, we had Sam Parfit. Sam was the CEO of the True Athlete Project and had a, a background in playing performance tennis. Now, we move on from tennis into uh, the role of a coach developer. My special guest today is coach developer for netball, Miss Sarah Green. Sarah is a really open, honest, and wears a heart on her sleeve type of person. And I'm delighted to have her on the show today because I'm sure we'll get some real great insights into her story. Sarah has also transitioned from one sport to another and is sure to share many of the gems and the experiences she's gained. So as usual, please sit back if that's what you do, go off on your bike, go for a run, but get into the place where you can really maximise the opportunities that you'll gain from hearing Sarah's story. Whether you're a parent, a teacher, a coach, or crucially a leader, you'll gain something from today's episode. Please leave a review, any comments, any feedback that you've got is always really appreciated. But crucially, it's great to hear some of the stories and the successes you get from listening in. So all it leaves me today is to wish a really, really warm welcome to my very special guest, performance coach developer for Netball, Miss Sarah Green. Sarah, it's really great to have you with me on the Sports Stories podcast. Thanks so much for finding a little bit of time in your very, very busy diary. It's really good to have you. I'm going to start because you won't know this. But I was talking to a previous podcast guest of mine, uh, Nathan Wood, who works at cricket. And he said, uh, I was just chatting to him. He said, "Um, uh, uh, do you know Sarah Green? And I said, yeah, I do know her. Why did you ask her to come on the podcast? She she would be great. So, you know, you've been recommended to come on here. So welcome. Thanks for giving up your time. And, um, you know, thanks to Nathan for sort of recommending and introducing you as well. So how are you before we get going? It's really important for me just to check in. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm okay, thanks. Um, that's nice to hear. I've, I've met Nathan, our new performance director is from Cricket, so he kind okay. of like connected us. So that's how um, we kind of met. But um, yeah, I'm good. Like the sun's shining today, so that's nice. It's been a bit of a struggle to get outside for the past <laughs> couple of days because it's been freezing. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm good, thank you. you know, just for the listeners, do you want to just give us a bit of a sense of, you know, how did you first get into sport and what was your introduction to it back in the early days? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I, when I was thinking about this this week, I was trying to think about kind of like, oh, you know, where did, like where did that come from? And I think, you know, I I really I'm probably one of those people that I don't know. Like I really loved school. Like I just <laughs> loved school. Like I loved primary school and I loved secondary school. I had really positive experiences, and. Um, I just had like, I remember my year six teacher, Mr. Palmer, he started a girls football team and I, you know, never play, I didn't play mixed football at all. And I think for someone of my age, that was quite unique. So I I always had a a girls football team to like play in. So that was really positive. We got to, um, I'm sharing my age a little bit now, but we got to be like, um, we didn't hold flags, but we held these little poles with the net team's names on for Euro 96, like um, at the forest ground and stuff like that. So we got to do that. That was really cool. Um, and then my secondary school, um, my PE teachers were just like really good. Like I, I was in every school team, um, just like did cross country, did dance, all sorts of stuff. Um, but I also um, quite early on um, did ballet. And um, I really like had a really good time like at dance and ballet and just really loved it. And that was just a really quite local thing within our community. Um, And then just got to the age at one point where my ballet teacher was like, I think you're going to need to choose. And interestingly, that question just made me think, well, if she thinks it's a problem then I'm going to choose football. (laughs) So um, I was, uh, but yeah, I just, I really, you know, I had a, I didn't have a family that played a lot of sports actually my dad and my brother just played football but um I just loved kind of being at school and kind of experiencing all of those different types of sports to be honest what was the family involvement you say they just your your dad and your brother played football did did it was was football everywhere and that was it and you ended up having to find your own way to others or you know what was that environment like for you yeah I mean my dad um had grown up like playing football and played like semi-pro type get your cash in a brown envelope type football at the weekend and me and my and I think we lived quite like a traditional kind of um week where my dad and my mum would like go to work and then on a Saturday we would go to our grandparents 
But then my dad would always get out of going to see the in-laws by playing football. And so would my brother. He would get out of going to visit grandma by doing that. So very quickly, I learned that I wouldn't have to go and sit and be bored at grandma's. If I got interested in football, I could go to watch my dad or, and play with my brother. So um, I did that. I really hated being a girl at that point because my brother got to go in the changing rooms and kind of like be in and around all of that environment. Um, but yeah, and my brother was really good at football. So my brother um, went through the academy system um, played for Notts County. Um, and that brought a lot of opportunities for me because um, we would go to summer camps together and we would experience all that kind of stuff. And we would be able to kind of enjoy that. And, you know, my mum was involved in education, so we would do quite a lot of summer camps and things like that. So yeah, it was, um, football was there and I was quite fortunate, I guess, at school because I did get to experience other sports but I probably never got to have an experience of being part of other clubs so it was always like football was probably going to be the only club that I um, got into which I don't regret because it, it's given me like a really good life but I do wonder like what would have happened wow. if I'd maybe had a bit more of a diverse choice to be honest. And, and you, you mentioned about the choice from ballet to football what sort of age was that when you were beginning to have to sort of focus a little bit more so yeah I think so I think that must have been like when I uh, moved over to secondary school so 11 12 or something and um I'd had a really good experience of ballet like I I really just loved it so I did ballet I did tap and I did like um da like a modern dance it was and you know we took part in shows and I got to do um be the snow queen and do a solo <laughs> on my own and I just like really loved that and I think um interestingly that being forced to make that decision and like commit was what really like turned me off that but I really loved dance and music but I, I didn't I wasn't ready to make a choice so I was a bit like well you know I, I think maybe I'm better at football and it wasn't even like the teacher was saying to me you know you're really good at this you could focus on this it was just like I just don't I don't think you can do both and you probably need to decide um so yeah that, and that was probably quite a, a pertinent time really for me because actually being a girl being you know going into my teens at secondary school being the only one of my immediate friendship group that actually played sport let alone that being football was quite tough um so letting go of ballet was probably like it seemed madness to my friends to be honest what, what were your recollections of that time then? You know, because the way you paint it is, you know, it sounds like it might have been madness to your friends. Was it easy navigating that stage? Or, you know, what learnings did you take away from that, those sort of teenage years that you can recall? Yeah, like, to be honest, like I said to you, I really loved school, mm. but um, I found um, the school environment at times and like navigating those friendships and stuff are probably like most like young people I found that really hard yeah. in particular I think because um as much as I had good opportunities to play like girls football um it, it wasn't really like a big thing so mm -hmm. uh, you know I wasn't going to the park after school and kind of like hanging out with the boys I was going to training or I was kind of maybe um invested in kind of wanting to kind of be better at football or I would go to all the after school clubs and the PE teachers liked me you know that that kind of thing or it and it, it was it was really tough and at times like I found um that whole self-image thing like really difficult just because um I was tall as well you know and that that was tough like it was really tough and I, I think it just kind of reflecting back on that like um I, I feel really fortunate that I had like really good, really good teachers as well. Like my, my parents separated when we were at, when I was still at secondary school right. and I never, I had a geography teacher that was just really, really brilliant. You know, I was struggling to like do homework and things and she'd let me stay behind after school to like do my homework at school. Oh, wow. And I just never forget those kind of like really valuable moments that, you know, and they say like teachers are really important, but yeah, like I, I think, that experience of school was valuable but at times it, it navigating that was was really difficult to if I wanted to stay focused on what I felt like was important to me. I'm conscious of those that are listening in here might also have a sense of you know they're either working with that age group or they've got children that are at that age group and helping them navigate it. Did you call on any strategies at all or what looking back how did you 
how did you navigate that difficult time? Because you talked there about, you know, body image. You know, I'm also thinking here, you know, you were a, a girl in a, in a sport that wasn't traditionally a female sport or, you know, it was quite new coming through there. Was, you are kind of groundbreaking in many ways, weren't you, quite early on? You know, and I'm just wondering, how did, how did you manage that? Yeah, to, to be honest, I don't think I really, uh, I don't think I really managed it in, in, in the sense of kind of, did I find that emotionally and mentally like quite tough? Like, yeah, like yeah. at times my my inner voice like my self-talk was was really difficult and many years back actually um I found a, a lot of my um diaries from when I was oh, a, a, a young, and it, it and it was it was just really sad and a lot of stuff that I'd written in there was stuff like um I wasn't sure whether I was um, like normal, like for my yeah. age. It, I was asking myself questions where I was like, is this what a girl of my age should be doing? Mm -hmm. And I think, and that to me, like reflecting back on that, I'm just like, oh, that's so sad. Like that was so sad that mm -hmm. I was unsure about prioritizing kind of like what made me happy. But the thing which maybe doesn't make sense was, I think there was still like a, as much as I was being quite negative and reflecting on that like there was still something within me that knew I, I did want to do it and I did want to you know because it made me happy like and I knew that I was actually quite good at football so um, going to training and being around those people and being successful and I could feel a sense of success and um, still kept driving me forward I think when I remember back to some of the moments which made me feel secure um, was just the coaches and the, and the teachers at my school that told me or made that you know I was doing well or, or created a space for me to be like it's okay you know and and they kept me feeling like I could come back I, I you know I, I really remember how I felt in those environments and that was you know I felt happy I felt safe and I, I felt like I could succeed Reflecting back, when, when when have you started making sense of some of this stuff? Did you know it then or did you just do what you did, um, you think? No, I mean, to, to be honest, um, I um, I think in the latter year, so I was kind of like um, much, much, you know, coming towards the end of school, actually, like 16, 17, when my parents kind of like formally separated, like right. divorced. Um, and I found that really, I just found that really hard. Oh, okay. um, and I think it, you know, it was just the sense of kind of like, um, just what does that mean? You know, it, and it was never about kind of like, oh, is this our fault or anything like that? It yeah. was just kind of like, you know, what, what does this mean now? And kind of like, um, I think just understanding kind of how you will be supported in from two different people in two different spaces. Um, and actually, like, um, I think I lived with a lot of kind of that upset and anger and stuff for a very long time. And it wasn't until much later, like 2008, where I decided that the best thing for me to do would be to talk to someone about it. So, um, and I've actually been... I think maybe on three or four different occasions um, being to uh, a counselling, so to see a, a counsellor. And I think, to be fair, I was talking to someone about this this week because I know people have different opinions of it. Like some people prefer to talk to their friends, some people prefer to talk to a stranger, whatever. For me, it was really important, actually, that I could talk to someone who didn't know me mm. and really could have no, not no opinion, but... Um, didn't really matter kind of the dynamics of any of the relationships and stuff um, I went to see a couple of councils actually councils actually that, that were terrible that were really like just really terrible like made um, made suggestions to me that I was just a bit like well no like why would I want to do that or really didn't seek to understand and the last councillor that I saw um, was absolutely one of the best best people that I've ever spoken to because I think I'd probably matured a little bit and I went in there and I said um this is what I need from you so this is what I need and I said like this is the type of person that I am and I need you to help me to understand how I can be making progress because the problem is I feel like I'm stuck I need to understand why I feel like this and I need to see that I'm getting better and um what was interesting about that was um she really listened to me and actually what 
we discovered was I knew how to help myself. Mm. I just needed to hear it, you know, and I, like she just, you know, so much happened during that period. So it was during that period, actually, that I was seeing that that last counsellor that I actually changed jobs. When I started going, I was going like every other week. And then sometimes it gets a bit much to have those conversations. So we like, you know, spaced mm-hmm. it out a bit. But one day I'd gone back to her and she's like, how have things been? I'm like, yeah, I've handed in my notice, actually. <laughs> like, I'm going to be leaving. And she was like, what? So, so, so um, but I just found, particularly that latter, that latter experience, um, just just so useful for me to try to understand maybe why I was behaving in some way. So let's just say like some behavior patterns that I'd established and I needed to break them down and kind of, you know, look at them. Um, I needed to understand that I could help myself and I was very capable of doing that. And I needed to appreciate how self-aware I had become and, you know, and, and embrace that really, because I hadn't, I hadn't, you know, I'd learned how to be very self-aware, but I, I used to just it almost be quite shy about the not own that and be like, yeah, I know myself well, and I know that I feel angry today, or I know that I feel upset. And I just, I didn't own that. I wasn't proud of it when actually that's a really valuable skill. So um, that experience for me was just, you know, a really, really valuable one that's helped me grow. And I think it's helped me be a better person and, and, and definitely better at, at my job. What, what keeps coming back to me, you know, at a high level is kind of nearly pivotal moments, you know, in terms of actually your parents separation and the pivotal moment that that court created for you, but also then actually finding the right person to talk to and how that's become a pivotal moment and how you've really captured that, you know, and I just think, mm-hmm. and, and also, you know, what also really strikes me is that the connection between you know, the, the job that you now do in terms of helping people, which we'll come to even more so, but, you know, how your journey has really kind of influenced who you are and what you do. I, I don't know. That's what I, I hear. Mm. You, you mentioned about your parents being working in education and, you know, you've told me about the kind of learning journey that you've been on. Where did you go kind of after school and then you went into your work job? And you also mentioned you, you left the FA, but how did that all fall out? And tell us a little bit about that journey. Yeah, so to be honest, I've probably never really spoken like out so out loud about this actually. <laughs> um, so I stayed at school, um, at, so I did A levels at school, and that felt very like safe for me. Like that just felt like the right thing for me to do, and I, I wanted to, you know, probably because I loved school so much. So I was like, why wouldn't I stay at school a bit longer? Um, but then. Yeah, that that period was quite tough. So that's when kind of my parents were separating and stuff. And I think obviously things were tough for them. So, um, and you know, we weren't particularly kind of like well off. And actually my parents were really young when they had me. Um, So they were still quite young. And I was never really like talked to or spoken to or I think about going to university. Um, I got offered a scholarship to America and that, turn that down because financially it wasn't like viable it wasn't you know and it, that was really disappointing but actually I was probably still going for a period in my mind where I was like I don't know if I can move away from home and just do that at such a young age um so I I went to college and did a um HND in like um sports coaching I think it was and then I got offered um a place at a women's football academy so switched courses and moved to this other college to kind of like play football and just but still kind of like study and whatever but for quite a long period of time after I'd done all of that like studying people would say to me about going to university and stuff and I'd I used to tell a lie I used to be like yeah I went to uni did I did a degree because I felt really embarrassed about the fact that I hadn't done it and I just felt really insecure about my knowledge and just kind of like it was quite pertinent then at the time I think that when you were applying for jobs, it was like, need a degree, need a degree. And I was like, oh my God, like what am I going to do? So um, I'd, I'd gone to America like coaching, which was a you know good experience for me. Played a bit of football at a university there, probably a bit illegally to be fair, because I wasn't play, doing a course or whatever. They just <laughs> drafted me. Um, but came back and then actually one of my first proper jobs is probably one of my most favourite jobs that I've ever done. Um, I got a job working for a, a charity called NACRO, which is a national crime reduction organisation. And I worked with young offenders at, um, or people at risk of offending 
through a uh, sports football project. And um, I just loved, like, don't get me wrong, emotionally, it was difficult. Like, you know, I'd get information through about these young people and I'd be like, oh my God, like, I, you know, how am I going to talk to this young person? Like, what they've done is just so bad. But um, I just loved it. I, lo what I loved What it did you love about it? What was it that you loved? Um, I, I honestly feel like behaviour is um, the result of something. So I don't believe that people are just pure badness. And don't get me wrong, I'm not talking about like, you know, maybe people who've got kind of like complex issues or like, you, do you know what I mean? Like people who, you know, sociopaths or anything that I don't understand that well enough. But people who maybe just like, steal sweets from a shop or kind of like you know yeah. take part in petty crime or you know young people I, I honestly believe that it, it 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 was an output of something else that they were feeling internally and I just felt like um, they just wanted to be heard and they wanted to be understood and at that point in time I think um, I was finding life quite difficult because I wasn't feeling heard or I wasn't feeling like nurtured and understood cared. You. <laughs> yeah. yeah so I kind of feel like um you know, I wanted to to kind of be there for those young people to try to understand and just make sure that they knew that someone believed in them and also, you know, keep them active and stuff. Um, I just, so I really, like, really loved that. And it was only just, I think I got to the point where I was wanting to invest more in um, my career. I, I was very firmly stuck on the idea then that um, I had a, a very fixed route of a career path, which was I would work at a county FA, and then I would eventually get a job at the FA. And, and that's really what I had in my mind. And this job at NACRO, like in football, was like my, my first kind of step. You opened the door. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it, did it work out that way? And, and you know what? You know what? I, just on the NACRO role, it, it, it sounded like that job for me was more than football, though. You know? Yeah, and I, but I probably didn't understand it at the time. I okay. think it's one of those things, isn't it, where... You look at a job description. So I think my job title was kind of like um, football project coordinator or something <laughs> like that. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to be like delivering football sessions and this, that and the other. When actually, like at the time, that that really wasn't the case. Mm. And but it's not until maybe much later when you reflect on that experience, you, you know, how important that was and what that taught me about myself. Um and, you know, that was never part, actually, what I thought I was going to end up doing was be a PE teacher, right? And then I quite okay. quickly worked out okay. that probably that that really wasn't for me and that wasn't going to happen. And then that's where I decided to go down the more coaching or football development experience. So um, that's what this NACRO job really was about for me, was really getting my foot in the door with that. But then ended up having this whole new experience with young people. And I was like, oh, you know... I, this is quite good, you know, I really feel invested in them. Um, did, it, did it open the door into the county system then, that job, or did it open you uh, open other doors, or how, do you, how did it progress? So, no, so I never actually got a job at a county <laughs> FA. I, yeah. um, after that, I went, so there was quite a period of time where there was a lot of investment into yeah. facilities. So I actually um, got a job at a secondary school as a football development officer, linked to a county FA kind of like partnership. But um, yeah, I was, I was based at school, kind of like managing a facility and whatever. Um, and like, I loved that job and I got an, but I think it, it kind of naturally like satisfies the cu a curiosity, which I didn't know I had, which was linked to education. Um, that was really important to me, but I didn't really realize it. You know, I, I wouldn't have probably taken that a role that advertised in that way. So Sarah, what was your curiosity about education in that school setting? Because, you know, you flirted around school a lot and you've got really fond memories, haven't you, of schools? So I guess, yeah. is, is that the basis of it? Or, or what was the basis of your curiosity there? I don't know, really. I think, so my mom um, was a nursery manager. So right. she managed um, nurseries um, all, you know, all of her work in life. After me and my brother went off to school, she was, you know, a nursery nurse. Um, she worked for Ofsted it's inspecting nurseries after that so we would have a quite a lot of experiences um, in school holidays in and around kind of that nursery environment and then in, in fact like when I was much older I um, my mum was working at a nursery and in the summer holidays I would work as a nursery assistant with yeah. the holiday group and things like that so 
I was always around kind of that and then obviously had that experience of being coached and being taught you know so that was always um, and I just looked kind of like kids and you know like just playing and kind of being interacting with them and stuff so yeah that I never really realized how much um, that played a part in, in my career but then from that secondary school position that FDO position and um, that's when the FA's PESCO skills program started and I got a job there and it was quite a legendary type um, big deal Trevor Brookings kind of big idea of how to improve football and skills for the 5 to 11s and um, anyone who was anyone any coach that I knew in and around the football circuit like that that was the place to go and then um, I was fortunate enough to get one of those positions yeah and it felt so spe you know like it felt so special like so um got this job uh tesco skills just i i, I went in as a skills coach and um i was actually got a job offered in leicestershire so i live in nottingham i got a job offered in leicestershire so that was you know not ideal but it was kind of like listen and I, at that point though I would have been I was in that thing where I'd like if they'd have said to me Sarah we can only offer you a pound a week I would have been like yeah fine <laughs> for free. I, was, <laughs> I was just like listen I will do whatever I need to do but um yeah and I was kind of just I felt so lucky and I I just felt like um I could it was just learning every single day um, and then I got so many opportunities. So the skills program was really quite revolutionary in the fact that it was very forward thinking, not being about displacing teachers. So we were involved in a lot of projects that was about upskilling teachers, really understanding like lesson planning and just, so I got involved in, I was part, um, part of the education group for the skills program and chaired that group. We're linking with other bodies like AFPI and all of that. And I just, I was thinking like this is brilliant um and then I, I got promoted to be a team leader so I was managing a team of skills coaches and you, you know like we were involved in national projects where or, or national meetings with the whole of FA education where we just you know away days and we'd get to see different coaches work or we'd be seeing the national teams work and you were just like this is brilliant it's like constant CPD all the time you, you mentioned a bit earlier though the idea about you know i was so lucky and and i just pick up your energy and passion for you know the, the job and i can see why you wanted to do it even you know back then but i'm also sat here thinking you know were you lucky or did you make your own luck you know in terms of how you've navigated your way in there and then opened doors and maximized opportunities you know if we just dig a little bit deeper than the yeah. the luck yeah what's your I thought mean, yeah, to be honest, um, I spent an awful lot of time prior to kind of getting that job at the FA um, volunteering. I, I made it my business to be where I thought I could learn the most. So um, I could, I, I would volunteer at like different events. I would support the Knots FA with different stuff. I was involved in this like... Um, football group that was about the Coalfield Regenerations Trust I think and I was like getting the bus there or because I couldn't drive at the time and I, I just kind of like you know made it my business to kind of learn from the people who I thought not could like um make things happen for me but would be like oh yeah well, I know Sarah like and she's pretty good like she she's she kind of you know she makes it her business to kind of be better and and I just wanted people to kind of know me so it was kind of you know if something comes up you're like oh, actually I know someone who might be interested in that or do a good job um and I think I'd learned that um from my parents you know one of the, my lasting memories, like my parents worked really hard and um, they they were very driven and very motivated and really drilled into us that like we had to like make things happen. And I'm, I'm never, me and my brother never sh work shy, like just get stuck in, do what we need to do. Can't sit and wait for things to happen. You go and make it happen. I think it's lovely to hear the results that fell out from, from yeah. that journey. So. So yeah. go on, what, what, what happened in the FA then? You know, you, you, you got in there, um, you know, you were on your journey around football at, at this stage. So how, how's, how did you progress with your, your footballing career and your coaching career from there? 
Yeah, I mean, so interestingly, I'd been coaching at like um, girls' centres of excellence and stuff prior right. to starting at the FA, and actually had started my A license before I started working at the FA. But I didn't. I'd done the first two weeks of it because it was very old. It was a bit old school then. Like you did two weeks at Lillyshaw, and then you went back the following year. But um, because I took this job at the FA, I deferred it and, and just said, you know, I'm going to be working to five to elevens. I need to like just pause that and like push it to one side. Um, but focused all my attention really on that job at the FA and it was just like yeah like I'm going to focus on this and I'm going to get better and I'm going to grow and the natural thing was you go in as a skills coach if you're decent and you're good and you work really hard you become a team leader and that that was all going really well for me um, and then quite quickly so I seemed to be up until that point a very much a, a two-year person doing a job and then I'd be like right I'm bored now like what do I need to do I've stopped learning like this isn't hard for me so I got to be a team leader and then I'm thinking, right, well, what, what's going on? And then there was a bit of like a restructure, reshuffle, teams growing and stuff. And I actually became what now is very stupid, but a, a super team leader, which meant that I was um, managing teams in more than one county. So that was good because uh, I took part in some more recruitment, managing people a bit further away from me. What does that look like? Um, you know, and that kind of filled in some gaps for me. Um, was taking on other projects and stuff um, but yeah quite quickly I, I thought oh, I don't know like I feel like I, I need more and I was very fortunate to be um, part of uh, a new team that the FA set up which was called um, coaching and education so the, the FA created a coaching and education team um, I I worked really hard um, to get that interview and in that interview like it was so important to me like I just but I actually they'd created a, another step in the skills program they were like called I want to say they weren't team leaders they were like some kind of operational kind of national leaders and I went for one of them jobs and I didn't get it and Martin Preston the skills program team leader right at the time who's now a very good friend of mine like I've been a really good mentor to me he called me and told me that I hadn't got the job right he'll remember this phone call for sure and I was absolutely devastated right and he he asked me a very important question he said to me can you talk to me right now or, or not like should we talk and I said no I, I can't and that was so important to give me that space because I was so sad and upset and I remember when we did speak maybe the next day or something he said to me I actually don't think you wanted this job I just I, I, I don't believe that you wanted this job and he was absolutely right I didn't want that particular how, how job. Did he, how did he know that? Do you think? I, I don't Dave I think you can tell <laughs> when I'm really passionate about something I literally think it just comes out of me without me realizing and I think he know he knew me so well that I hadn't been able to fake it I I thought I wanted I thought I could do it and he said he did say to me he said I have no doubt that you could do this job yeah. but I believe it's not what you really want and and he was absolutely right. He so was. there's that real subtlety, isn't there, between, you know, I, I can do the job or I really want the job. And I think that sort of subtlety is really important, isn't it, in terms of what yeah. comes out of you and what comes next. You know, because and he you... did me a massive favour because if I'd have taken that job, I probably wouldn't have felt like I could apply for the education and coaching team, because the PE coordinator role, because it would have been too soon. And that, that job came next. I got that job. I got, you know, was working with the Premier League clubs up and down the country. Great to be involved in some new projects. Um, got the opportunity to work quite heavily with First for Sport to write a new qualification, you know, framework, all sorts of stuff. Like I uh, got to go to China, deliver projects for Chinese tea. I just, there were so many different opportunities, but again, quite quickly. Um, and I got promoted to be a manager in there. And actually what was very interesting was that journey about being a manager for me felt so different this time. I felt like I was in a completely different place personally. I felt like I could lead and manage so much better. Um, so create much more independence to the people I was managing. I, I felt more confident doing it and doing it well. Um, but sorry, I, sorry to cut across, but while, while you're there, you know, I'm just thinking, of, I guess when you went for those that job and didn't get it and you, you got the job in the education you wouldn't have known what the education job was yet, though, would it? Because it was kind of a blank sheet of paper. So it's, and I'm just interested in that concept of, you know, people 
um, applying for things. And, you know, actually in the world nowadays, we actually don't know what's ahead of us. Do we? we have to kind of embrace it and go and create it. And it sounds like you had a part to play in creating it, but also have to trust it. Yeah, it's so difficult to kind of live in that concept of like <laughs> what will be will be. Please. And, yeah. you know, if it's meant to happen, it's meant to happen. And um, uh, but I think it did teach me a valuable lesson about kind of, um, I, I, you know, and it's hard because I don't really know what it feels like. Um, I've never been in that situation where um, I've. I've had to apply for a job because I needed to apply for a job. I've been yeah. quite fortunate that when I've been applying for jobs, I've always already had one. And I think that that adds a different level of stress. Yeah. But um, I think uh, I do understand now from that experience that actually when you're passionate about something, um, you, you can't fake, you can't fake it. I think there's an element of kind of, you know, if you're really into something, for me anyway, I, I'm I don't have a poker face. If I'm unhappy, you know. If I'm if I'm happy, it's obvious. And I, I I needed to hear that and to be like and be okay with that and be like, listen, you know what, Sarah, like everything that you you put yourself forward for now, you 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 need to understand like what that feedback was and you know do you want this job or do you, are you exploring the experience or what what are you doing with this and just be okay with that so if i'm just exploring that experience i'm unsure about that's a job that i want and the feedback coming back to me says we're not sure if this is the right job for you i need to embrace that and be okay with that because i didn't know that either so um you know it taught me a, a, a really valuable lesson it's also a lesson, and I, and I don't know if this is true for you, but I'm also hearing I wonder whether there's something about the, you know, the, the, the knockback and how you create that level of resilience or some of the trendy words, bounce back ability that actually spurred you on to say, OK, I really need to go for this in a different way or let people know who I am and what I'm passionate about. Or did you use it as a, as a springboard, do you think? Um, I think that's difficult because I, I, I don't know if I... I was so upset about yeah. it and I, I think my my reflections on that would be I was so upset that I probably learn about yeah. to just really reflect on that experience yeah. and I probably had already developed a good level of resilience through yeah. life at that point anyway yeah. um it didn't no, you know no experience that I've had and I can't tell you like where I've learned this from or whatever nothing that I've had experience that I've had has stopped me from going in the direction that I want to get to okay. like I, I no one or nothing will tell me that it's not that I can't do it you know that doesn't I, I just want to find different experiences and, and have different experiences and be like listen if, if that's the way I think I need to be going I will keep going in that direction you know that's not going to stop me I think what it probably did do what well, I, I learned very quickly about um I probably needed to use my network better I think up until that point I'd been a bit more self-reliant in you know independent I've not spoken to anyone about whether I thought that was the right job for me um and I've had mixed experiences with that to be honest I've probably had experiences where I've, I've spoken to people too much and I've taken <laughs> on board their opinions and they've not I've not you know I should have trusted myself I've probably spoken to no one and probably could have done with having a critical friend in those experiences. And I think it kind of, it helped me think about, you know, that and, and using other people to, to reflect on in those situations. But um, just the, you know, having that opportunity and that interview and, and using that to kick forward into that next space for me, that PE coordinator role, and then, you know, continuing my journey on at the FA. Um, but, I think what was really pertinent for me was I kept moving forward at the FA and I think one of my one of the most memorable experiences I had we, we worked with a lady called Liz and she came in to do some stuff around line manager training you know really lovely just very good like very good to me we had a lot of really good conversations and I remember saying to her like um if I left the FA um I just wanted people to know that I was a nice person and I was kind and that I was okay at my job. And I didn't necessarily care if people thought that I was the most experienced football person yeah. or, you know, that I had, I knew about the game or I, I didn't want to, that wasn't important to me, but I hadn't really, 
I'd gone through all of my football coaching career, you know, doing my B license, whatever, going to football clubs where people would say to me, oh, so are you an A license coach then? Like, what do you know? And I, so I'd got confused and I felt that like that was really important. But then she told, she spoke to me about this and she's like, what do you want to be remembered for? And I said, I, I want to be kind. I want people to think I'm nice and I, I want to kind of be good at my job. So we did this exercise. I remember it's December, in the December and, um, people had to write on a sheet about you go around the room right and people wrote on my sheet and when I took it home at the end of the day it was just stuff like a bit passionate nice person you know great team and all this and I just thought and you know what Dave there was something in me at that moment and I thought to myself it's time to go now not not like my job I wasn't particularly happy but I thought to myself I think it's, I think I can go. I think I can, go. it kind of gave me permission go. to explore going. And um, then just by chance, the January, I saw a job on Twitter. <laughs> Someone had shared it, retweeted it. And I thought, you know, I've, I've been playing netball for a few years. I, I, let's have a look at this. Um, it was a coach developer role that really attracted me because it was pure coach development. I got in touch with the the person and just said look you know are you looking for someone from netball because I, I don't have that but I think I can do everything else she was like no like would really welcome your application went through a, a really difficult period then because I was like do I leave do I not leave and if I'm someone I can't even remember who this was but someone said to me why don't you just go to that interview and work out if that is a place that you would want to work and I thought what a great what a great bit of advice that is. I don't even know if I want to work there. So they could, I'm, it's almost like I was interviewing, interviewing them. Interviewing well. them, it flipped around here. Yeah. I, I thought, well, yeah. So I went in there and I thought, I'm not bothered. I've already got a job. So I just want to know if this is somewhere that I would like to work. And it was a bit difficult because it's one of them ones where they have you all in together in the morning. And I was like, oh, God. You know. <laughs> yeah. But it was fine. I knew what I needed to do in order to kind of um, be myself. I was comfortable that I didn't need to be the shout and the scream and all that. I could just be myself. So did you so, tell yourself that before you went? You know, you've done a lot of work on yourself in terms of thinking this through. And I'm wondering, did you consciously go and say, come on, just be yourself? Or, you know, but you're also kind of... Um, you know, the idea of, I'm going to use the word competitive with yourself, you know, you want to be successful here. And therefore, yeah. the idea of do I be myself, which will help me be successful? Or do I try and be what they want to be successful? I think I had no idea what they wanted right. at all. And I, I think I'd probably got, you know, so what are we talking about now? This is maybe like 18 months ago. Yeah. And I think I'd got to the point where I was like, um, if they don't want me, it's not a reflection on me. I'm just not what they wanted. So I, I felt quite secure in that I could just be myself. And if it wasn't what they wanted, it's not, not the place for me. So I went in there and, um, you know, I've always been, you know, obviously having a career, coaching career in football, always been one of the only females in the coaching course, um, used to it. On this interview day, only female. It wasn't, you know, I was used to that. It didn't scare me. And I thought to myself, I know I've got enough about me to have a good conversation with these other people that I don't need to be that purposeful disagreeer just to stand out. I'm just going to be myself and see what happens. So I got through to the afternoon and I won't ever forget this experience either. One of the best things that told me that this was going to be a good place for me to work is the performance director at the time said to me, one of the questions towards the end was, um, can we just ask you, like, how do you maintain a positive self image throughout your work? And I thought, what a great question, you know, and like, what a great question for an employer to ask an employee and to show that that is potentially important to them that, you know, they're considered, and I just, I, sat, I said that to them I was like well, what a great question and I was very comfortable at that point about where I was in my life so I said yeah I'm, I'm going to be honest like I, I found that difficult at times but I'm also not afraid to ask for help so I've been to counseling a few times and da, 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 da. and I thought to myself well 
if they're going to be like, oh, no, Sarah's like pins and counselling, you know, we're not sure about that, da, 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 you know, that's up to them. But I knew that I was honest about who I was and the experiences that I've had. Um, and I just left it there, whatever. So um, I got offered the job. And those days after that were difficult because I purposefully created quite a lot of opportunities for them to say to me, that's not going to work. So it was stuff like uh, the car, money, start, and I was just like pushed back a bit because I, I was scared to leave. I was really scared to leave the LA. And what, what, and were, it, you, what were you scared about? You know, you, you've mentioned uh, that a couple of times, the, the difficulty, and I know swapping jobs is difficult, but what, what was it, do you think, that was really... And my identity. I, I was worried that... Um, you know, being involved in a footballing community, any sporting community, whether you've grown up coaching tennis or being involved in tennis, you know, the football community, like people knew me, you know, Sarah Green, she's from football, she coaches football. And, uh, you know, as soon as I stepped outside of that, I was worried that I was going to lose my identity, in particular, if this was a bad decision from me. And I thought, well, how will I how will I go back to that world? Like what, you know, what if I make a mistake? And, you know, will I be taken seriously? I'm going to lose my credibility. All of this stuff was just going through my mind. Sarah, did you um, go through all that stuff on your own? You know, how did you work through that period of time? Because loads of people listening to this will be going, this is really similar to me, changing identity, changing roles, those discussions. So how did you manage that time for you? Um, I spoke to a few people. So I had a few uh, colleagues that had worked at the FA and left actually. And, um, but that was hard because they were saying to me, just leave, like the grass is greener, you'll be brilliant, did it? And I found that really hard because I'm like, is that your actual thought or is that because you've left? And like, this might not work out for me. Um, I used uh, a few neutral people. So um, Liz, who I'd spoken about previously, I called her and she basically just said to me, one of her questions was, um, do you believe that you can do this job and do it really well? And I said, yeah, I do. And she said, okay, well, you know, and I, she just believed that everything that I was telling her was that I, I thought I could do it. And um, I, yeah, so I, it was difficult because I found it difficult and I, to talk to people who had already left because some of those had had bad experiences on that exit and all of that. So, and talking to kind of neutral people really did help me, uh, you know, people that weren't invested in either party, to be yeah. honest. Um, but yeah, so eventually kind of I, I made the decision. It was difficult. It was difficult to tell uh, my colleagues, actually. My colleagues were absolutely brilliant. I remember we had a meeting and I sat down with two of them and I said, um, I've got an interview. And they were devastated and also so thrilled and supportive that it made me cry because we, we talked a lot about as managers about supporting each other to want each other to be the best that we could and if that meant exit then that meant exit and you know two of those colleagues now I, I speak to a lot and they're just so supportive and that made me feel like I could do it like I, I could do it and um, leaving was really hard I'd spent 11 years at the FA I'd grown up there I'd been through a lot of a lot of life but also one of my main drivers to leave was I wanted to go to somewhere else and now be the person that I believed I was now in 2008 when I started the FA um, I was an unhappy young woman really because of life I was you know not every day but yeah, I'd, yeah, I, was at, I was at a different point in my life really and I was I still always had this thing at the back of my head that 11 years later, I think a lot of the relationships I've built at the FA had grown through that time and maybe people still judged me on how they That's believed right. I was, yeah, rather than who I was now. And I was very keen to go, do you know what? I'm going to go to netball and I, 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 I just want to be the Sarah Green who I, I think I am now. That was so, so important to me that I could start again and 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 also have an impact in a different space. You're giving me goosebumps by you talking because it's quite, that's massive stuff, isn't it? You know, kind of re, not just changing your identity, but nearly starting again or reinventing yourself or giving yourself permission to go and be you rather than um, Sarah Green f football. It's, this is now yeah. Sarah Green, isn't it? And, and actually Sarah Green for what she brings. 
you know. I think that's really, that was really important. I remember, um, so Nick Lever and I are really good friends. He was actually the skills team manager, like national manager when I joined the FA. And we've remained really good friends and kind of gone through a really good journey of our careers together. When I told him about um, me leaving, he put me in touch with Jen um, Cody, who's in his team and she'd just started as a coach developer. And he was like, you know what, she'll be really good. You know, why don't you speak to her? And um, Jen's brilliant. Like, and we're really, really good friends now. And I spoke to her quite a lot. And I remember one of the things that she said to me was um, she'd introduced me to a few people and she'd say, oh, this is Sarah Green. Like, she's from the FA. And she said to me, I need to stop saying And at that time, I was still working at the FA, but she was like, I need to stop saying that really, because that is not who you are. But for a really, really long time, that was who I was. It, it, I was Sarah Green from the FA, because the FA, it, it kind of, it gave me gravitas. It, it, it gave me kind of like, it was, I, I was important. And I was only talking to someone about this yesterday, that I really desperately would, wanted to lose that I was so grateful and I am still so grateful for the opportunities I had at the FA uh, learning growing it's made me the coach that I am today I was so so fortunate for that and you know will never ever be ungrateful for that I needed to lose the element of that part of me that I thought made people want to listen to me because of who I was and yeah. that job title yeah. I wanted people to want to communicate with me because of uh, being Sarah. Yeah, who yeah. I am, as opposed to yeah. who I'm, as opposed to who I work for. Yeah. Yeah, because it was perceived knowledge. I deliver FA courses and stuff. I, I said I was talking to Jay Rope yesterday, right? And I said I firmly believe if I'd have delivered on a UEFA B and talked about playing out from the back, and I'd said to the coaches, "Listen, if you just get it, just whack it long. That is honestly the best thing that you could do." I think loads of them would do it because they were like, Sarah Green, she's from the FA, right. um, she knows what she's talking about. And that bothered me so much. It, 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 it bothered me so, so much because I, I wanted them to question, and you know, to, to question. And there was elements of like, you know, as encouraging coaches to do that and question and challenge, but there was still kind of like this perception that FA, like those people in those roles, they knew what what was everything that was right they were the gods of football and that was one of the draws for me coming into netball is because everyone I now work with knows more than me about netball how do you manage that then Sarah how, that that kind of dynamic now how how does it sit and feel for you being in this in this new environment and I, I'm conscious not to say FA and netball because I think the principle of what you're raising is really important it's not the organizations it's about the perceived um, power and authority and credibility that they bring, which can detract from the individual, can't it? People moving job will have the same challenges. How, how is it now? Yeah, I think it's an important point that you just raised there. I think well, actually what was kind of different in my FA role was I had a mixed role that was education, development and, you know, kind of like um, quality assurance. So I was kind of playing different roles to different coaches. So when you were educating them, delivering a course, there's an element of them trying to take from you what you know. Um, so that and that's difficult because you're trying to be three roles to kind of one coach, and and that's really tough. That that is really tough, and I found that increasingly difficult. Um, but yeah, coming into netball, I'm not going to lie. Like I, um, I had to make a decision about uh you know do I talk about football or not when I came into netball so I, I for a long time I didn't I really didn't I, I've been in, in in meetings with people who were like oh I used to work for such and such and I'd be like yeah we know like let it go like you know and I just I was almost a bit embarrassed to talk about it to be honest at times but then there were times where I thought felt like it was useful to reflect on that experience and be proud of it um, I found it tough to uh, initially, but I think it was my own type of imposter syndrome of just like, they know more than me, that or they're going to be thinking, to, to, you know, like, what does she know? Um, I never experienced that back at me. No one ever made me feel like that. It was just me. So I kind of learned to let that go a little bit. But just to be clear here, you, you, I guess you've come from football where you've been an educator, and the words are quite important here, aren't they? As an educator and a coach, and the role you're playing in netball is not an educator or a coach, is it? It's a different role, is that right? Yeah, so I'm performance coach developer. Right. So, um, and I think 
it, it, I personally believe that if they'd have got someone from netball, they probably would have got this person to deliver it in a different way, in a different function. Um, because I, I speak to quite a lot of the other coach developers in that network and they're all kind of doing dual role stuff so they might get involved in educational delivery or technical and tactical input and stuff but actually um one of the biggest attractions for me coming to this job is that I couldn't do that I couldn't have mixed relationships with any of the coaches I work with which meant that sometimes I was teaching them or educating them and sometimes I was supporting them in, as a coach developer because I couldn't do that. I, I, I'm not skilled to be their coach educator. So it was just so brilliant that I could come in here and just be there to support them and just help them be the best coach that they could be. And just to be here to kind of like nurture, support and, and help them grow. Yeah. And there's a real clarity there, isn't there? And the simplicity, isn't it? By taking some of the the ambiguity or the fluff around the words and the roles, it sounds like that's really helped you, but it also might help others understand who you are and the value you bring as, you know, you're an expert in helping people get better, aren't you, as opposed to an expert in football or netball or whatever. Well, it, that's interesting. One of the first meetings I had with Andy, <laughs> Andy Bradshaw, right, he said to me um, something about what, what our function was, right, and he said, you know, aren't you there to kind of, like, help people get better? And I said no I don't like that I don't like that phrase like I'm not there to kind of like help people get better like I just feel like that felt um like I they needed me or you know and I but then you know in its most simplest form like you are but those words felt didn't didn't sit right with me and I'm like I'm just here to kind of like help them grow and I preferred those kind of like words yeah. to kind of be there to be that support system but um you know like when I was reflecting on this transition like don't get me wrong um I've got a lot of things wrong you know I I've, <laughs> I've got a lot of things wrong in this transition I um I didn't allow myself enough time to almost and I don't want to seem dramatic here but to grieve really to kind right. of to kind of grieve for the, the, for the that routine and that experience that, that you know what was um I just I just went from one to the other. I had a, a little bit of a break after the FA and then I went to Kenya actually, which was brilliant and, and building schools and stuff. Had a really good experience with that. Um, came back, started at netball. And um, I just, I kind of wish that I'd I created a bit more mental time and physical time to, to really experience that. And so when you say grief, you know, I, I think I understand what you mean, but it's not, a, it's not a word that you would ordinarily hear in this space. I think I get it, but just to help the listeners. I can't really think of a better word, but I think there was an element of like, it, it almost, felt, I feel a bit guilty for saying this now, but, but I think at that point in early on in that transition, a few people had mentioned to me, um, because it's quite a normal practice at the FA to be fair, that people leave and then come back, people leave and come back higher up higher up and stuff and I think um there was elements of that nagging in the back of my mind I'd be like I'll be back you know whatever but I was also I was I was you know I'd lost a lot of um friendships or, or you know working relationships that were really important to me and also like I was coming into a role at netball that had not been it was new it had not been done by anyone before I didn't know what I was doing so and I'd gone been working you know my, my work in life for I don't know the past 10 11 years I knew what to do every day you know I, I knew what was expected of me what to do um I didn't know what to do anymore so I'd I, you know I was working in a different place um I was also at that point um expected to kind of be in the office uh, at Loughborough um I'd not experienced that for 10 years either being in an office really so I was just like kind of just trying to let go of something yeah. and parts of that I didn't want to let go of yeah. and I, I found that like that really like really really tough but there was um, a process I went through and to be honest it um our performance director at the time um was like brilliant with me um i found things quite difficult early on i came back from kenya and actually was pretty poorly for like a few months and so um starting this job we had the world cup and i was kind of like making my way around you know and all of this and she was just like look sarah like just 
try to understand what your job is, work out what you think you should be doing and let's just go from there. And she was very supportive. Um, I would say quite quickly, maybe six months in, uh, you know, keep in touch with some of my old FA colleagues and or speaking to other friends and stuff, speaking to coach developers I've met. Um, I honestly, and I can sit here and say this now, I can't ever, ever see myself going back to working in that kind of football environment solely like that. Um, I don't think I realised how much I'd missed out on um, by being in a broader sporting um, network. You know, as soon as I stepped outside of the FA, I realised how big the other coaching world was because I think the rest of the governing bodies the rest of the sporting world is is much much more connected whereas um, maybe I'd just been in roles uh, the department I was working in I don't know um, we just spoke to football um, and even though that football world was big uh, it, it kind of on reflection made me feel like we'd kept it quite close like I wasn't getting a lot of new experiences or new interactions came into netball a lot smaller we rely on networking with other people and I'm just like where are all these people come from like I never knew all these people existed and like they've been so important for me um, and my understanding of my role and shared experiences and um, just you know that support in this environment and weirdly now weirdly I was part of a meeting the other week um, with the FA. So a, uh, a pathway meeting, yeah. me, people from rugby, the FA, you know, sharing experiences, talking about kind of, you know, doing a bit of a, a scoping out exercise to support the FA about how, you know, how they might be looking at their pathways. And I'm like, what a strange turn of events. Like <laughs> this is, in the, but in the sense of like, great to see, how valuable it is for yeah. different sports to be talking about their pathway. And, you know, I, I hadn't, I, I, I firmly believe that there was two things that ha went wrong for me at the FA. I forgot to dream. I forgot to dream bigger because I thought that I'd hit my dream. I, I, I peaked too soon and I forgot, once I got there, I forgot to dream bigger. And um, by doing that, I just became a bit blindsided. To, to looking what else was out there and um you know hadn't I, I probably closed myself off I feel like in the last 18 months I've had more experiences just than maybe I did for a lot of the time that I was working in the FA. Blindsided and dream bigger you know those kind of two massive concepts and I wonder whether we can even speed those revelations up in our life or whether it's a, a matter of circumstance you know that we go on the journey and these things kind of fall out when the time's right who knows but it just sounds like you're in a, a fabulous place it feels like the blinkers have come off you know and I, and I love the idea of optimism and dreaming because I think if we can all do that imagine what we could achieve hey yeah and I think that's a really interesting kind of the wood for the trees um one of, uh, Martin, I mentioned kind of uh, earlier, one of my mentors, he had this whole, he used to talk to me uh, when I was a manager, I had oh, a lot of young manager, had a lot of different <laughs> difficult experiences managing people. And he used to give me this me metaphor about um, centre parks. And he used to say to me, sometimes, you know, when you're in the middle and you can't see all the trees are on the outside and you just can't see the way. And he's like, but that doesn't mean that there's not a way it just means that at the moment you you can't see that and and there was a lot of times where I felt like that was so true like I knew there was a way out and I didn't know the way and I got so stressed because I didn't know the way and he was like it doesn't matter it's like when people say you know when one door closes another one opens he's like well it might do but there also might be like five doors and you're not sure which one to take and and, and that's okay and then I, you know, I think I, I've said this quite a lot over the past six, six or seven weeks. People have asked me a question about, you know, um, what what would you do differently, or like what would you say to your younger self about this, that, and the other. And I, I just honestly wish that I'd felt better about just being myself. And I think that's kind of coming from coaching experiences. I've been told quite early on that um, I needed to be louder 
you know, if I was going to be taken seriously as a coach, I needed to be louder and I needed to be a bit firmer and all this. Um, and I lost the sense of like who I was and I felt very under pressure about being someone and, and, and actually at times became a bit miserable and a bit aggressive in my language or a bit blunt because I, I was trying to be someone that felt very uncomfortable, that was a stretch for me and I, I lost who that was. Um, and at times I, I wish that I'd been, I wish that I'd been braver to, to, be, to be myself, but been braver to, to kind of push myself a little bit further sooner but um, do I think I would have left? The, do I think I should have left the FA sooner? Yeah, uh, but there wasn't an opportunity for me to do that. So I'm, like I say, I'm very grateful for that experience I had. All of those experiences have made me who I am today, and I, I'm, I'm so grateful for that because I think I'm in a better. And, and I don't think could it have been accelerated? Yeah, probably. But um, I've, I've still got a lot. A lot to learn and I think I'm I'm learning so much more now being in this environment because it is a stretch it's a continuous stretch for me like every day I don't know as much as anyone else so that and that feels really good it feels good to 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 be in a continuous state of stretch for me mm. so I think one of the things that is really important to me is um is just acknowledging like my behavior and, and also how I feel you know like I think maybe having those experiences and there were a lot of things that are quite vivid in my mind like I, I remember the day that um, my dad said that you know he didn't love my mum anymore and what's really interesting about that is I remember how powerful that conversation was because a lot of people might go oh my god like you know your parents separated wasn't that traumatic but actually my lasting memory of that is how brave my dad was and how brave he was to say that. And to me, that, that's really important. And then there's been a lot of moments after that, you know, and the conversations that I've had with different people went to counseling is like, it's really important to me that I acknowledge like when I'm happy, sad, frustrated, because I need to understand what gets me to that point. And, you know, I'm not saying that I deal with all of that perfectly, but I also feel like um, it's helped me be better and more in tune to supporting other people because um I think I you know ultimately what lies at helping anyone in whatever environment is understanding them and their motivations and being attuned to kind of like what makes them happy what makes them sad you know and I think I, I'm I'm good at that with myself and I want to try to kind of show that that's important to me and that's what helps me kind of um, or drives me and I'm not saying that you know everyone needs to kind of jump on board and like be like oh yeah like let's understand each other better but um it is important to me and it's important to me that I can um be okay with and and be and be quite transparent and be quite vulnerable and you know um uh, because to be honest at the start of this podcast you asked me how I was and you and I was like yeah I'm good I'm good but five <laughs> minutes before that you'd ask me how I was and I'm like you know what I'm not having the best day but actually I knew that and I, I acknowledged that and I, I didn't feel great this morning but um actually through the process of kind of like recording this I I feel a lot better and I think part of that is because um it's really helpful to me to verbalize um, my thoughts and feelings. And also when I verbalize that, and when I say things out loud, part of what I've done today is kind of talk about that journey that I've been on. Um, and I'm okay with saying that actually, I'm quite proud of where I am today, mm -hmm. because um, a lot of those experiences have been quite difficult, have been uh, tough. And yeah, like one of the bravest things I've ever done is leave something that I was really happy at a place of work that I was really happy at that I was really good at to come to a place that I didn't know if I could do the job and if I would be taken seriously um and so I'm really I I am really really proud of that and that's taken <laughs> that's taken a long time to get to and to move towards that that point of being do you know what like, I'm okay with who I am I'm proud of you know where I am today so what also drops out for me is, you know, I, I can really see why you do the job you do. You know, the journey you've gone on in terms of your self-discovery and that awareness gathering uh, along the way. But, but also in terms of, you know, and I want to draw this a little bit because you work in a performance environment. 
you know, and, you know, the, the principles that you're talking here about showing that vulnerability and that awareness and being honest about the, the tough times as well as the good times and just being kind of clear is actually, for me, one of the principles of, um, you know, it's a performance enhancer, isn't it? It's a developer. You wanting to use some of those attributes because then it's given you choices, which, you know, I've clearly heard you drop out here. It's informed the directions I've taken. It's not always made them easier, but at least I'm dealing with reality or what's going on. I sincerely hope those that are listening will have picked up loads of gems and uh, have got to know you, but also have really challenged themselves with some of the, the questions you've posed, either to yourself, but also to them. Um, I'm going to ask you, are there any kind of resources or books that have supported you on your journey that we might be able to share with some of the listeners? Yeah, I mean, to be at my, my fabulous bookshelf behind me. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, to be honest, what's really interesting about... Um, about books and stuff is I'm not always the best with them, right? Yeah. So I'm kind of a, a holiday reader or um, uh, got furloughed last year for a little bit. So spent a bit of time reading there. Um, I There's a few books that have been really pertinent yeah. to me. Um, so Blink was a, one of the first books I read. Um, more like, as in like, a, you know, a work type of book. Someone yeah. recommended it to me. And I was just fascinated by that because there's that whole thing of kind of like, do we know what we want? Um, you know, and, and and I I felt like I really did. I do like being tuned into that, and that kind of like really spoke to me. So that was a a really important um, book. Um, then there was kind of like a couple of books. And me and my Nick, we do um, our birthdays are in December, and we do a birthday Christmas exchange. Like every year, we get each of the books, and he's really good at buying me books. Um, that make me cry actually because right. they, they really touch me like they really like kind of get to me so one of the best books I've re uh, read recently is called In the Heat of the Moment and it's by um, Sabrina Cohen Hatton and she is a fire chief she's one of the first female fire chiefs but and it's a kind of um, a mix of a bit of a biography and a bit um, I would say like worky related type educational book um, and there's some stuff in there where she talks about really making high pressure decisions about um, how many people will die depending on what decision she makes. And I was just like, oh, my God. And it, it, it honestly is fascinating. Um, and that and he also got me a book called Running Like a Girl. That's a book that I read on a plane to Melbourne. And I remember reading it. And it's about this girl who basically is not a runner and she teaches herself and she's ended up running the marathon like two or three times now and I was reading this and there was something in there about how she'd written it that really just touched me about how she described the 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 how proud she was of herself and the emotion and the thoughts and the feelings of what it felt like to run the marathon to have all these people be like so proud and and I, I, I was books I've never experienced like book making me cry before but like I was in that it really in it and I think there was just something about those two books in particular like Blink was very pertinent in my yeah. kind of working career yeah that makes sense to me I think um, Running Like a Girl was very pertinent because it was kind of like you know what like she's done something there that's made herself really proud and like she didn't know how to do that before yeah. she yeah. taught herself how to do that and I was like I was really like invested in that and then I read that in the heat of the moment last summer, actually, and I was just fascinated by again, she, the the girl, uh, the woman was homeless at sixteen. Um, she wow. kind of pursued something. She'd done a PhD and this, that, and the other. Not necessarily had a traditional educational background, you know. Um, now educating and supporting other people, talking about decision making, and and I was just like, wow, this woman is amazing. And they were just books that. You know, we all get taught, like, don't get me wrong, I've read a lot of other books that are kind of very in, uh, you know, but those two books, for me, were important. Like, they, they triggered something in my head that was like, you can do anything that you set your mind to, to be honest, Sarah. Like, just, you can do what you want to do if you care about it enough and you're passionate about it. And that's the key. I, I could, I could 
look at other people's journeys, look at other people's work and be like, oh yeah, you know, that's good or I could want that. But if it doesn't light a fire inside me or I'm not passionate about it, I can't do it because I am not a faker. <laughs> like I, I just, I can't fake anything. I, I, you know, what I'm passionate about is what I'm passionate about and that's what drives me and gets me up and gets me going every day. Brilliant messages there. And I, and I love the idea, you know, I can't fake it. And I'm, I, I guess my question to, to the listeners and, you know, something you, that you've worked out through your career and your life is, you know, why would we want to fake it if we could have something that we really want to do and can really be passionate about it and add value to it and enjoy it and earn some money from doing it if that's the, what's required. So why fake it if you don't need to kind of stuff? I've got a couple more questions. And the next one would be for me again, you know, you've talked a lot about how you've turned up into the world and the transitions that you've been through how do you prepare yourself on a daily basis both sort of mentally and physically yeah so some of them are really simple like um muting whatsapp groups okay. um putting my putting my phone on do not disturb um so sometimes i find whatsapp groups really overwhelming um yeah. i'm very um i'm a very responsive person i think so i think like when emails come in i can be triggered by that and want because i can be a bit um people pleaserish so i can be like oh that that deserves a response and it deserves a response now so i actually have no notifications on my phone generically anyway so no none for twitter none for any of the social media on a normal daily basis so i don't get triggered to respond automatically so i do that anyway and i actually have that on my laptop as well so i don't get a notification of a new email um only if i go in and check so it's so you're managing like, it sort of thing you're driving yeah. it yeah, yeah. yeah so I'm, i try to kind of do that every day um but yeah like so this morning i put my phone on do not disturb and just left it and thought right well I don't want to be triggered by it or be distracted by it to be fair because I've got a tendency to procrastinate and just get you know down rabbit holes on Twitter or something if I'm trying to avoid that and um, being outside is really important to me um so just getting the opportunity to like walk and stuff uh I've taken up running since the start of the year and that was just because and to be honest a lot of that was me telling myself that I was I couldn't do it so I just started with the couch to 5k um and yeah just really like loved it and um uh, there was plenty of times when I'm like I hate this I hate it it's so <laughs> horrible but actually I think for that for me it was about finding out that I could do it so that that's been really important um I, I think like boundaries and rest is really good so I had a couple of people who messaged me last night and this morning saying oh um hi like do you want to meet up for a walk do you want to go for a coffee whatever and um I I would really I really would love to and they're people they're not like people that you know would zap my energy or anything but actually um if I did that today I'd be squeezing them in and I might be missing something out myself so I it takes I'm not great at it all the time <laughs> but when I feel like you know I'm not having a good day I think I, I, I have to kind of say to myself Sarah is this the best thing for you today is it is it fair to them that you're going to squeeze them in is it fair for yourself um so I try to kind of be be okay with that and be like right listen keep your boundaries keep them safe keep you know prioritize self um so yeah just just normal thing, really. two more questions you mentioned a little bit about um you know a younger version of yourself when we spoke uh, you know a little bit earlier in the in the podcast what, what kind of two or three principles would you give to people coming through and saying you know how to live a kind of a high performance or a happy successful life what would be the two or three key words or principles would you share do you think yeah, I mean, this is, it's an interesting one, this, because I think, do you remember last year, like Marcus Rashford, um, he wrote a letter to himself, I think, his younger self or something. And um, I, uh, so I actually did that. But I think he, he wrote a letter to himself um, really quite young, because he yeah. was only young anyway, when he was like seven or something. But I wrote a letter to myself um, and I just picked a, a really pertinent time in my year. And I actually wrote a letter to myself when I was like 23 or something. Okay. And I, I kind of just reflected back on um, how I thought I was feeling at that time and, you know, tried to kind of almost say it'll be all right, you know. And I think for me, um, I think there's some stuff in there about um 
being okay with not necessarily having a goal like having that kind of goal or dream and stuff like that because there were times you know like I used to say to people I don't know what I want I don't know the only thing I've ever been really firm on ever about my goals was like I thought well I said I wanted to work at the FA and then buying a house you know so and, and I knew that and I was very clear like I couldn't tell you now what I thought I'll be doing in the next year or then you know I don't particularly have a career goal and I think that's one of the things that I've tried to do is um be present so I think we can chase things forward and not enjoy where we are and I've definitely spent a lot of time doing that so I think in terms of you know be okay with not having a plan so therefore be present and enjoy every moment and every experience and that's a very important thing to me that I talk about coaches in terms of giving athletes really good experiences and in turn enjoying their coaching and that experience um because we go from session to session day to day to day the people say live for the weekend it's monday again like i think we just need to be be present and and be okay with that and you know like i say i think we it's it's really hard it's really hard because my younger self i don't know if she would still listen to me but i think just be okay with uh, but I think young people have got it a bit harder now because of social media and this that and the other but I also think that young people are fascinating to me like they're so much more open and so much more um kind of flexible with life and who they are and prepared to talk and share about that and I think that's something to be admired and something to be praised and I think um yeah just be okay with who you are and just enjoy the moment it's not okay you don't no one needs to have a life plan of one three and five years like you don't <laughs> you don't need it um last question you've been so um open and capturing in your honesty and your awareness of your journey the highs and lows as, I, as i've mentioned um and i've shared your story whose sports story or you know somebody in and around the sport world would you be curious to find out more about and why yeah do you know what this is it's it's quite difficult really i mean i think um from a um just a a a person kind of like perspective like and just some of the experience that i'd had with him like um i am a big number one fan of gareth southgate I, i just think for me he epitomizes what it is to be a great person and a great coach and um there's a lot of i, I was really fortunate to spend a, a, a bit of time with him working with the the 21s and um yeah. you know keep in touch with him and he's he's done some stuff with the roses um for us but i think he epitomizes like being a good person mm-hmm. valuing the team the language that he uses is is about the team it's not his team um and i think he's experienced you know some difficult times and and managed to kind of like turn that around um so definitely him and I'm going to cheat a little bit because well I like cheating you're pushing the boundaries again Sarah look at you (laughs) yeah go for it I also think that um like Jess our head coach has got a really interesting story because actually as well as being a player actually the early part of her um learning journey and educational experience Uh, was in the NHS Um, you know and I think that's kind of where we talk about the roles that people have had that that they're not too far away from kind of like helping people and being around that nurturing and empathetic type um, roles and I think you know that's really um, that's really interesting and fascinating to me. Thank you so much. Now should some of the listeners be interested how, how could they contact or find out a little bit more? Uh, I guess the best place is Twitter. So yeah, I think that for me, that's probably the best place. I, I kind of am pretty good at kind of sharing like what's going off on there. Um, so yeah, Twitter's probably the best place. Brilliant. It's been great to have you on and, and I look forward to having you on again in the future. Okay, so that's uh, uh, hopefully I can tie you down to doing that because I, I know the next stage of the journey sounds like it's going to be uh, pretty impressive. And Sarah, thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. The chat was good. It's a very cathartic chat today for me, actually. So thank you. Brilliant. All right. Take care and we'll see you again soon. 
So there we have it, the 44th episode of the Sports Stories podcast, and what a great episode it was. It was a real heartfelt, open, powerful story from Sarah today, which really gave a lot of her personality away. Yes, there was a few little glitches uh, in the audio, but for me, I hope that didn't detract from the journey that she's been on, the messages that she provided. And clearly she's had a, a real journey through uh, professional discovery, but also a real self-discovery in terms of actually the awareness that she's gained, the uh, insights that she's had and how um, she's really reflected on her learnings and experiences to inform where she goes next. Now, two or three things that came up for me was the importance of asking for help. She really uh, labored that in some ways and showed the value of talking to friends and colleagues and respected others for various things in her career, whether it was during her change of jobs or whether she was looking for a little bit of guidance or assistance. She went to a counselor at times, but she also relayed on really close friends and colleagues. Um, and it really drove home for me the importance of choosing the right people to surround yourself with, but also seeking that help. The second point that really dropped out clearly for me was the challenges around her identity and changing the role from working um, for the FA right the way through to moving over to working with netball and how that was such a toil and a trouble and a you know a challenge for her but having worked it through and read the signals it actually dropped out as being the right move for her and changing role was the best thing that she could do as she kind of acknowledged the other thing for me around changing role was also the importance of um, the title that we have and how that plays um, sometimes very positively but also can actually lay quite heavily and be quite a, a burden on, on you in the role that you do and actually recognizing that a title sometimes could get in the way of the work that you do and I thought she really tussled with that greatly and also found a real positive way through that and last but not least um, the idea of learning from others Sarah's approach to life I think is that she's pretty much a sponge and really likes uh, picking up new ideas stretching herself pushing herself to the boundary uh, and exploring new new horizons and I think the idea of leaving a sport where she worked for 11 years and then went into another sport and recognized that actually there was so much more out there to learn from uh, and that horizons had really been stretched was fabulous and I really like the idea that she saw that as a positive in terms of stretching herself but the value that she brings to the work she does um, and I guess I'm also a little bit biased because that plays to the the principles of sports stories in, in a sense of sharing swapping looking in different places um, but also being able to connect it back to your environment so three really powerful takeaways uh, there were many many more um, but I hope you've taken something away for you if they're not the three that I've recommended there and as always I'd like to pose a couple of questions to you which really came through for me during listening to Sarah's story the first question would be how does your job title help or hinder you as well as who you think or believe you are and the second question what are you really proud of doing or saying in the last few years and why? What does this say about you and what does it give you? The fact that you've really been proud of something and achieved something. So two big questions uh, amongst many that I could come with and Sarah actually posed a couple of questions herself. So take the ones that are relevant for you, but I really encourage you to go away and think about how her story can connect and be applied back into your context and to your environment. Now, focusing on your personal and professional development, I'm really pleased to have received some really positive feedback this week from uh, one of my listeners, Tim. Tim really shared with me the, the value that he got from the podcast, but also how he shared it with his work colleagues to really help them and challenge them in raising their performance standards. So thanks, Tim. Please keep sharing your successes and your stories as they're really helpful. Keep driving us forward. Now over to uh, a couple of reminders and thanks uh, as always um, social media and on the website uh, www.sportstories247.com are the places where you can keep in touch with what we're doing there's loads of good resources coming forward um, which leads me on to um, the program which is being launched in uh, about a month or so's time and if you're really keen to continue developing your coaching and leadership impact whether you're struggling with what's going on at home and work you're looking to get a better work balance or you are looking for some inspiration around how to lead your teams uh, and become an even more impactful and effective leader then this is the program for you so the program is called once again maximizing your coaching and leadership impact and, and have a look on the website for further details there furthermore uh, as, as resonates with today Sarah really talked a lot about the, the support that she both has received from coaches and mentors or counselors 
but also the role that she plays in helping others developing their practice, whether it be in sport or out. And so I just want to draw your attention to the, the coaching and mentoring offer that we have at Sports Stories. Again, have a look on the website. There are a number of different packages that are available to, to everybody's needs. So please have a look there. Um, if you would like further information and it's not on the website, please drop me a note. So all it leaves me is to say are two really big thank yous. One to you, the listeners, for listening in, sharing your stories, your successes, offering reviews, giving me feedback, uh, and obviously joining me on the podcast. And also a big thanks to uh, today's special guest, Sarah Green. It's really great to have Sarah on as she's joining the, uh, the vast array of great guests that we have on the podcast. So enough from me from today. Thanks again for joining me. And I really look forward to another fantastic guest on the Sports Stories podcast. Take care and bye for now.